¡Tan, tan! ¡Super pasajero! ¡Ha llegado para luchar por el pueblo! Close my eyes. Aquí estoy el super pasajero luchando por el pueblo y los derechos de los pasajeros del autobús. Hello and welcome to Todos Somos Marcos. I'm in Los Angeles with uh, Martin Hernandez, organizer with the Bus Riders Union and the Labor Community Strategy Center. Hi, Hi Martin. How you doing, Peter? Good to see you. Well, good to see you. Martin, you were on my very first show. Oh, uh, man. Okay. Here we are again. Now, uh, since I met you and got involved a little bit, uh -huh. I've been very impressed with the Bus Riders Union and the campaign that you guys have waged and uh, been wanting to get down and do a show about it. So Thank why you. don't you tell the audience what the Bus Riders Union is about? Um, well, the Bus Riders Union is an organizing project of the Labor Community Strategy Center. It was started about six uh, years ago um, around the issue of air quality and uh, civil rights and, and environmental justice. Um, Los Angeles, one of the, the, the most polluted cities in, Los, in the world, in, and especially in the nation. And one of our um, main uh, campaigns is around air quality issues and the intersection of uh, multinational corporate forces in that arena. So uh, we had a campaign organizing in Wilmington around the oil refineries. Uh -huh. And the other leg of that campaign, the clean air campaign, is for a transportation system that gets people out of their cars like this. It's affordable, it's clean, it gets people where they want to go. Okay, now is it true that one of your main thrusts has been that the district is spending entirely too much money right. on high priced rail systems that you feel serve the affluent suburbs? Right. Right. The MTA has spent um, MTA has spent billions of dollars on projects like this, yeah. like the Red Line Subway, and has used a lot of money that they could have used to improve the bus system yeah. to pay for these projects. So what we have is uh, a transportation system, a bus system that is very old. Half the fleet needs to be replaced. Half the, half the buses need to be replaced in this fleet. Yeah. Um, so that's where we have a lot of major issues with overcrowding on these buses. Yeah. yeah. Buses that come late because they're so old, they break down, or they pass people up because they're so full, they can't pick up any more people. So people are getting uh -huh. late to work, uh, losing their jobs, you know, under those conditions. And at the same time, so you have buses that come coming late, they're full, they pass people up. Well, at the same time, you've got these trains down here yeah. that are not even full yeah. and are going to cost billions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. Well, you guys have really educated me about this. I really am, I, I agree. The buses, I've always believed in buses. The buses, a city of Los, like Los Angeles needs it. It's hard for me to get over my attraction for the Blue Line, which oh, takes sure. me from my home in uh -huh. Carson uh, to downtown LA pretty efficiently. Right. I wish we could have both. I think at one time they could have had both. They yeah. could have had a, syst a light rail system. And, and in fact, at one point, we published a book called LA's Lethal Layer, which was dealing with the mm -hmm. politics of air pollution and why certain communities are affected by air pollution and others aren't. Politics of race and, and class and things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We were advocating uh, a light rail system but the backbone of that transportation system being buses. Yes, yes. But what happened was uh, 
a lot of the money got spent into these subway trains, which were billions of dollars in cost. Yeah. Yeah. Just sucked up so much of the money, you couldn't even have that. Yeah. Uh, so now the MTA has, after several years, has found out that they don't have the money to finish a lot of these subway lines, or even some of the light rail lines, so they've suspended these projects and are putting more of their resources into the bus system. Well, uh -huh. Now, uh, Martine, didn't the Bus Riders Union bring a major civil rights suit to force the exactly. district? To, uh, I think this was really significant. I remember me and you had it at a church down on Wilshire that was right. a wonderful event. Now, this was under, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, yes. The, uh, what, uh, what was the Title VI? Is that Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, I believe. And, and it was um, regarding the use of federal funds that you can't use federal funds about indiscriminatory practices. And you showed... The other part of it was 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Uh -huh. unequal, unequal. You know, unequal protection. And you showed that the massive allocation of funds for the, the uh, uh, rail lines inordinately favored the wealthy, mostly suburban, exactly. it was over a, the inner city, mostly minority population. Right. Just disparate use of funding. If you have like 70%, 90, about 91% 90, 90 of the people who use public transit here in LA, they use the buses, like right over uh -huh. here. Uh -huh. uh, the other 10% use any form of the train, either subway and the yeah. blue line. Uh, but they were getting, but the bus system was getting about 30% of the funding as opposed to the rail getting 70%. You have a school system like that where you're only serving, you know, uh, you got 90% 90, 90 of the school children in one district, but you're serving with 70, with more money in another. That would be fair, obviously. So we were able to prove to the court, which um, at that time they were, um, they had one, of the, one of the things that they were raising fares and eliminating a bus pass, so we sued them on the disparate use of the funding. And as part of the settlement, you got a board that you have members that sit on, yes. and you got a commitment to uh, beef up the bus fleet. Well, what we have is what we have is what's called the joint working group, which is we meet to, in order. To, this is like this is a group that administers the consent decree, any disputes between the MTA and the bus riders union. So there's bus riders union members and MTA officials that we meet on a regular basis. Uh, the other part of it, what we've got is uh, a commitment from the MTA to reduce overcrowding. And that to us means an increase in the fleet, replacement oh, of the old fleet, which the MTA is going to be doing for an accelerated plan uh -huh. from uh, a lot of our pressure from uh, protests, meeting with the board members, meeting with the CEO of the MTA and our no seat, no fail campaign on overcrowded buses. The MTA has uh, beefed up the original plan to replace the old buses from a, a plan of 1,300 to now it's 2,100. So they've added 800 more buses yeah. to what they were going to do. And that wouldn't have happened without some, some kind of movement like this. Because, Martina, in a little while we're going to be going out with some organizers on the buses mm -hmm. where you're going to be addressing the riders and trying to get them to do what? I mean, to join, support the Bus Riders Union No Seat, No Fair campaign. Part of the Again, as I mentioned, part of the, what, one of the provisions of the consent decree that settled a, a civil rights lawsuit was a provision to reduce overcrowding on these buses. Uh, the MTA has not met the standard from, the deadline was December 31st of 1997. Uh -huh. They have not met that standard and now it's like nine months later and we're fighting with them to figure out how they're going to do that. And we're saying they need to buy more buses. They're saying, well, if we replace all the old fleet and everything will be fine. But since they haven't done that, we've launched a No Seat, No Fair campaign to put more pressure on the MTA and to animate the people on the bus to say if the bus is overcrowded, more than the standard that uh, the MTA is talking about, which is an average, uh, the old standard was having an average of 22 people standing on a bus, the new standard should be an average of 15 uh -huh. people standing on the bus, and that's going to go down over the next several years. Um, and we're asking people that if, if the bus is overcrowded to that standard, not to pay the fare.
I am Super Pasajero! Huh? What bus is that? 46, still there. Okay. The bus driver's way, you guys. Can you take the pit on it? Safety pit on it. When you're behind them. Hey, Coral. No, no, you gotta leave. There you go. Tan -tan! Super Pasajero! Ha llegado para luchar por el pueblo! Close my eyes. Aquí estoy el super pasajero luchando por el pueblo y los derechos de los pasajeros del autobús. Este es Cesar Chávez en todo. Sí, pasa, dale da un volante. No, but the, don't you have the, the super pasajero pass fly? No es cierto, no te creas. Llévalo. Buenos días, señor. Yo soy el super pasajero luchando por el pueblo y los derechos de los pasajeros del autobús. ¿Cómo le va? ¿Puedo entrar? Usted dijo buenos días. Gracias. Buenos días. Ya dijo que era buenos días. Buenos días. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Ok, gracias. Lo siento. Buenas tardes. Yo soy el super pasajero. I am super pasajero luchando por el pueblo. Diciendo que... Hi, Kathy. Dicemos que no asiento, no pago. Todavía la campaña, campaña continúa de no asiento, no pago en los autobuses sobrecargados. We're telling you that the Bus Riders Union is continuing with the no seat, no fare campaign on overcrowded buses. And my friend Fabian here has information about our campaign. And we're asking you to join with us and fight against the injustice of the MTA. Estamos pidiendo que ustedes luchen contra la injusticia del MTA. Y de luchar por más autobuses en, en, en ese sistema. ¿Qué piensa señora? ¿Está listo para luchar? ¿Cómo? ¿Qué hace hacer usted señora? ¿Qué hace usted señora? Buenas tardes señora. Hi. Sí. Uh, super Pasajero, and this is part of the No Somos Sardinas campaign. This is part of the No Seat, No Fare campaign for so, 1,600 clean natural gas buses. Now, uh, this one isn't too crowded, though. Mm -hmm. is that, uh, see, it's 4 o'clock. It's going to get a little bit more crowded as we Later go. on, it'll probably get crowded. It's in the rush hour. And, then and some of these are newer buses, too. They've added uh -huh. along this line. They've uh -huh. put a lot of these new clean natural gas buses. Yeah, but the thing is that although you have made progress, they are doing some, but you guys are trying to promote the fight for to have this kind of service more exactly. universally available. Exactly. People should be able to get on the bus, have a seat, mm -hmm. not be too crowded, get to where they want to go. Not get stuff like sardines and not yeah. be late and get there on time when they get on the bus. I'm Super Pasajero. I'm fighting for your rights as, as uh, civil rights of the bus riders. And you're a Super Pasajero too. Good question. There should be as many people as there are seats, and that should be 43. But there's only supposed to, only, under the court order that we've got, they're only supposed to have an average of 15 people standing. It used to be an average of 22. That's what we're fighting for right now, to get more buses to reduce the overcrowding on the bus. Everybody should have a seat. What they should have is everybody should have a seat. Nobody should have to stand on any of these buses. Well, some people like to stand. Though. Some people like some to stand, people sure. Like to stand. And you know, if, if there's you know three or four people standing on a bus, you know, for a little while, that's fine. I think maybe ten maximum. Mm -hmm. Have them uh, maybe uh, maybe ten people on the bus. See. When we first met a few years ago, or a couple of years ago, uh, in a group that was supporting the Zapatista movement in Chiapas, Mexico. Right. That's continued to be the thrust of my show, 
and I know that you've continued to be interested in this. Do you see a connection between what the Zapatistas are attempting to articulate in Chiapas, Mexico, and what the Labor Community Strategy Center and the Bus Riders Union are working on here in Los Angeles? There's, there's clear connections between what's going on in uh, Chiapas and what's going on here and other places as well. Um, the struggle with the Zapatistas in Chiapas is around the Mexican government and its role in supporting American imperialism and corporate policies that are giving profits to multinational corporations and uh, taking the resources out of Chiapas, uh, making money for you know, stockholders and multi multinational corporations, uh -huh. but leaving the country devastated and not leaving anything in the area. Similar situation going on here around the transportation system where we have uh, similar corporatization of government and an attempt to move public resources exactly. away from serving the people and towards and serving to elites or exactly. uh, yeah i see that. corporate rail contractors um more of the elite uh even elite of color same with elected officials who have uh, you know anywhere from you know uh, progressive such as antonio Villagosa. And, uh -huh. um, Certainly, Mayor like, Bef late Mayor Bradley, who just right, died, was right. was Richard, a bit of Alatori, William Molina. A lot of these people <laughs> who represent what class do they represent? And yeah, it's more to be of the elite people of color, elite Latinos. Ivan Bradley, Burke, in South LA, who sit on the board and have supported these rail projects at the expense of the bus riders and yeah. the people. So. Right. So I mean, we need using the government to, make, you know, help uh, make profits for, for multinational corporations. A similar thing going on in, in uh, Chiapas, where the Mexican government says that's bad for business, and they're trying to, you know, smash that down. Everybody, welcome to our bus. This is going to be our bus today, and what I'm going to do is take you on a ride on the sort of strategic overview of the campaign that we're waging, where the victory, the bus deep. Where the impacted bus riders get to choose and say who they want to represent us a redistribution dramatically of the funds of the MTA from rail to bus. But I need to lay out for you that this route that we're going on is not just a straight, smooth, easy path. There's some twists and turns in the road, and each bus stop has its own set of complex dilemmas and contradictions that we're trying to resolve in the most positive way possible so that we can move this work forward in the interest of number one, the class that we represent, the 350,000 bus riders, and number two, in the interest of winning a victory toward rebuilding a left, a left that is focused and strong and clear enough to both reject and confront the right and also articulate an agenda and a vision that can capture sort of the hearts and minds and consciousness of people. So the first stop that we're going to stop at is the system itself. Let me talk to you a little bit about what I call the crisis in governance and the crisis in corporate capitalism. For those of us who are interested in having a conversation about socialism, let's put that on the shelf for right now. I want to focus on what for right what is one of the most egregious stages of corporate capitalism that we're living in today, where the state and the government is more and more seeing itself and asserting itself blatantly as the Robin Hood of the corporate class. Between Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton and everybody in between, what's going on is both an attack and a seeding of all the reform social net demands that were won from the New Deal to the civil rights reforms to Roe versus Wade to the war on poverty and a complete dismantling of the net that was catching poor people and communities of color and women and place marking longer term struggles for the left. So now when working people in South Central LA say, I can't find a job since GM and Firestone and Goodyear shut down and moved to the third world, the government's answer is GATT, NAFTA, 
and an elimination of the extended program, the extended benefits program for workers who can't find jobs after 26 weeks. Now, when women say we are dying of breast cancer and our children have leukemia and we're being poisoned, the AQMD and the EPA's answer is, dis is deregulation and passing the pollution marketplace trading nonsense and, and um, GATT and NAFTA as well and repeal of the Delaney Clause. The MTA fits right into this formula. This board has not been moved at all by the half a million bus riders who are 94% of their ridership and of whom 81% are people of color, of whom 60% earn a family income of less than $15,000 a year and of whom 57% are women. This board has not been moved by demonstrations of hundreds of bus riders. It has not been moved by testimony of people saying, I can't take my kids to the doctor because I can't afford a $6 round trip bus ride. Or people are saying I have to stand for two hours on my ride to work. Or women saying I'm being assaulted at the bus stop because it's not lit and I'm waiting hours and hours for a bus that won't come. What this board is being moved by is rail contractors, cost overruns, and campaign contributions from corporations like Tudor Saliba and Parsons and Dillingham. It moves them to prioritize one of the biggest budgets for public works in the country, a $3 billion a year budget around a bankrupt rail strategy that will in the end serve no one but corporate rail contractors and that will in the process violate the civil rights of thousands of bus riders. So we need to understand that as the front man for Tudor Saliba, the MTA is going to continue to fight us along this route in many different sophisticated forms. Everything from trying to co-opt our demands, to trying to split our forces, to trying to delegitimize us as the bargaining agent for the class. The second place I want to stop on our route is what we call the effort to build a united front. Because see, it's going to take more than bus riders to, to win this fight. And we at the Strategy Center and the Bus Riders Union believe very firmly in organizing people around more than just their immediate direct self-interest. And we believe that a victory, a victory for working people and for low-income people and communities of color and women is in fact a victory for the entire society. So we're trying to pull together churches and unions and community organizations and liberal progressive elected officials, folks from communities of color and the white liberal west side, bring them together around a campaign that is fundamentally anti-racist, feminist, and a direct challenge to the profit motive of corporate America. <laughs> Si tenemos una reunión aquí en el este de Los Ángeles, piensa que puede venir o que tiene interés de, no sé, con un sábado o un... Eso lo también. Eso no, también es una campaña. Piensa que cuesta mucho ahorita la Era una pase semanal antes. Y eso ha ayudado mucho del pueblo porque mucha gente no, puede, no alcanzan 42 dólares en el principio del mes. Pero, en vez de, pero puede hacerlo cada semana. La MTA votó de eliminar el pase hace, un, hace cuatro años. Esa es la razón que lanzamos nuestra demanda contra ellos. Porque estaban poniendo más dinero en el sistema de rieles en vez del sistema del autobús. Esa es la razón que estamos pidiendo que la gente unifique con nosotros para, para luchar, porque la lucha de ustedes para mejorar el sistema, podemos ganar más si hay más gente involucrada. Esa es la razón que estoy aquí, como el super pasajero. Con el COVID, hace cuatro años, y hemos ganado algunos nuevos buses, y estamos dejando que la gente sepa lo que está pasando con eso.
Oh. Then we're going to keep up the pressure on the MTA to give them a flyer. We're asking people to sign if they want to become members, if they're available to come to a meeting right here. Read the flyer, tell us what you think. Oh, okay. Let's just around. Great, thank you. Oh, yeah, maybe she don't have to read this in Spanish. ¿Cómo? Tenemos en inglés y español. Buenas tías, ¿cómo están? Somos el sindicato pasajero. Yo soy el super pasajero. ¿Cómo le va? Buenas tardes, señor. Buenas tardes, buenas tardes. ¿Cómo le va? Buenas tardes, señor. ¿Cómo está? Of being a cameraman for Tony Summers Marcos. It's the only cameraman I'd ever be. Isn't it the most exciting thing in the world? So well paid. Don't you feel that it's going to save the world? Yes. Oh, I'm glad Anything to hear that. Off camera. <laughs>